All right, folks. Yeah, it's seven o'clock. It's farming our time. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm Steve Carlson. I'm here in uh, the Practical Farmers of Iowa office in Ames, Iowa. It's kind of fun to see where everyone else is tuning in from. So if you want to post that in the chat box, please do. Um, yeah, and tonight we've got uh, we've got our speakers here from over in Nebraska. I think they're maybe near Johnson City. We'll have to ask where specifically they're at right now, but we're going to hear about the research uh, from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln where beef, beef systems specialist Mary Janowski has uh, looked into utilizing cover crop residues and cover crop forage for um, for value and, or for, excuse me, for calves and for beef cows. And so uh, Mary's joined by farmer Lane Meyer of Meyer Cattle Company and he's been integrating cover crops, he and his family on their family farm into their cattle operation for nearly 10 years. So um, together Mary and Lane are going to share some data and some insights on our topic tonight of grazing cover crops profitably. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about PFI before I turn it over though. So this is the last topic on our fall farm in our series. We're going to take a week off and then start up in 2018 in January with our winter farm in our series. So uh, if you're not already on our email list, I'd be happy to add you. You can put your email address in the chat box there, and I'll let you know um, real soon what our next 10 topics or so are going to be. We, we do these always on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll start up again first thing in January and go all through January and February. So um, tune back in for a topic coming up. Um, just last week we had uh, farmers talking about the same kind of topic as tonight, grazing cover crops profitably, and that was... Uh, from John and Ian Stiggy uh, on their farm in Kansas, and they yeah they spoke last week and we recorded that. There's a link on the screen there for you to go to our farm and our archive where there are 130 some archived farm and ours from past Tuesdays. So check those out. We're recording tonight too. So if you want to revisit this or share it with a friend, you can find that in the archive at that link. So Practical Farmers of Iowa, we've been doing uh, farmer to farmer education now for over 30 years. We are a member based nonprofit um, founded around 1985 and um, we consider ourselves a big tent. So tonight's topic is um, you know utilizing cover crops uh, as forage for cattle but this this farm in our series we've also done on uh, some on flower production, um, on rolling cover crops and, and just about everything in between. So we we consider we like to provide programming for farmers in all enterprises. So if you can grow in Iowa, chances are we've got members that do it. We welcome everyone, and we try and provide programming for everyone. And our main uh, our mission at uh, Practical Farmers is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And we do this to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. And our activities at Practical Farmers of Iowa, uh, the way that we accomplish our mission is through a number of ways. Um, we have our cooperators program, which is our on-farm research program, uh, where we help farmers design and implement replicated on-farm research trials on whatever issues that they're curious about. Again, that's in horticulture and livestock and row crops and, and everything else. Um, and then we help farmers share their experiences, what they learn with their research, or just what they learn on their farm through events like this, this farm and our, um, through on-farm field days and workshops, and then of course at our big annual conference, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks here in Ames, Iowa. That is January 18, 19, and 20. You can go to that website, pficonference.org, to read more about it. We have uh, New York Times best-selling author. James Rebanks coming to keynote and lead a few sessions on his experience grazing or herding sheep over in the UK. Um, we've got more than 50 sessions planned, so there's bound to be something that piques your interest. So check out that website and plan to join us for our conference in J January. And if you like what we do at PFI, please join us. We're a member-based organization, and we really um, have a great, wonderful, active, diverse membership group. And uh, you can see some of the benefits of being a member there. You get discounts to things like our conference, and you get our great quarterly newsletter. But really, it's uh, the network of members that make this group so special. And it's people who want to see a sustainable agriculture put on the landscape in Iowa and in Nebraska and Kansas and all of our surrounding states. 
and it's people who are willing to help each other improve profitability and improve efficiency and improve their stewardship. So you can tap into our excellent network of farmers uh, by becoming a member today. You can get that information on the website. And then finally, a couple of rules. Just make sure that you're respectful of other people in the chat box and that you're respectful of our speakers. Um, definitely utilize that chat box to ask your questions. That's what that's there for. We want you to think up your questions and, and answer them. And, and Mary and Lane are, are happy to, uh, to take your questions and answer them the best they could. Um, so while they're speaking, it's a good idea to kind of keep your questions on topic because they might come to that topic a little bit later in the presentation, but um, if they see your question and want to answer it, they'll go for it. Otherwise, I'll make sure we circle back at the end when they're done speaking and get a chance to go through the questions that were missed. Um, but use that chat box, please. And then um, finally, we do want to get a little feedback from you. So there's a link there for a survey um, that'll give you a chance to tell us about what you thought about this topic, but then also tell me what you want to hear about in the future. So as a member-based farmer-led organization, we take your suggestions pretty seriously. So if there's a topic you want us to focus on in the future, there's a question in that survey um, for you to go ahead and let me know what that is. And also there's a chance to win a PFI hat or shirt or something just by taking that survey. So um, I'll put that survey link in the chat box a little bit later, but if you want to click that now, you can sit, set it aside and then uh, take the survey later. So we really appreciate your feedback. Um, and that's what I've got here uh, as far as rules and practical farmers info goes. So Mary and Lane, I'm going to pull up your presentation now. Whenever you see that, feel free to take it away. Well, thanks, Steve. I know you asked us to talk a little bit about uh, ourselves, and so uh, I'll just start off. I am a beef system specialist out of UNL, but I work with um, an agronomist and an economist and a part of a team where we look at integrated crop livestock system. I get the pleasure of working with great people every day, including uh, farmers across Nebraska, which I very much enjoy. So uh, that's really what I do. We do a lot of cover crops and a lot of crop residue work, and it's a lot of fun. Lane? Well, my name is Lane Meyer, and... Uh... My wife and I, we farm and got cattle here at Johnson, and we farm with my parents, Ron and Susan. And actually, my dad, he, he come to join us here, so he can chime in if, he's, if you have any questions for him, or if I can't answer him, maybe he can. Or if we don't know, we'll find, find somebody that does. But uh, yeah, we just run a cow-calf operation, uh, farm corn, soybeans, uh, we've been harvesting a lot more rye, and I sell some beef and dairy semen through CMEX and beef semen through Cattle Visions, and we have an online, two online sales a year through Caldwell Willoughby, where we sell embryos uh, the Monday after Easter and the Monday after Thanksgiving. So that uh, that kind of sums it up. We're we're small, we don't know much, and we just uh, never worked a day in our lives. <laughs> so you you uh, harvest rye for seed, and you sell that to the cover crop companies? Yeah, we uh, we we went away from from using wheat uh, as a in our rotation and went to rye, and it's worked pretty well. We keep some seed for ourselves, and and we sell seed uh, elsewhere as well. And then uh, Myrcorth Aviation, they do all of our flying on a cover crops from Rockport, Missouri, and they do a real, real good job. Uh, Steve, I think I need to get control. Somehow. Let's see. Let's see. Are you trying to move your slides? Yes. Okay. So you don't. Uh, there should be two arrows on that bottom left corner of that of the slide of that box that has your slides in it. And I've, as your status as a presenter, you should be able to see that unless it's off the screen somehow. Nope. I got it. All you right. Do? Yep. 
Thank Perfect. you, Steve. Yep. See, this is this is why we have the experts. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to start off and talk a little bit about uh, some of the data we have using cover crops uh, in Nebraska, and then uh, we're going to hand it over to Lane, and he's going to talk a little bit about his uh, experiences. And so where I'm going to start really is talking about uh, using cover crops either in the fall, and so planting after, say, corn silage, after wheat, um, or maybe even after alfalfa, we've been doing some things where alfalfa that's coming out of the rotation will kill before that fourth cutting and, and put in uh, cover crops so that we have a nice uh, seed bed for the subsequent crop. And then the other opportunity we've been playing with uh, more recently has been spring forage, uh, really thinking about uh, and corn bean systems being able to get some spring forage. So the number one factor to consider is when can you plant? That really dictates what you should plant. And for us, anytime uh, before September 1st, we can get some fall forage production. But after that date, uh, we really are looking at planting something that's winter hardy, like rye or triticale, and, and thinking about getting uh, some spring forage because if you look at our yield potential after that date, after September 1st, we get very little uh, yield. So this is actually some oats that we planted after corn silage or high moisture corn. We've done this for three years now. And as you can see, after high moisture corn, this two weeks uh, makes a huge difference in the amount of yield we get 500 pounds an acre. That's in Mead, Nebraska. So uh, that would be kind of north uh, central in the eastern part of the state. It's a little bit north of here in Johnson. Um, they get a few more days than uh, Mead does. And if you think about for Iowa, uh, your date might actually be a little bit before the September 1st date, uh, especially as you go farther north. So planting dates extremely important. Uh, it can make the difference between a crop failure for fall forage and success. I also wanted to just briefly talk about nutrient content and uh, you see these two pictures here. We have we have uh, a picture from no early November and one from early December and if you look at these forage types, the first thing you would think is, well, this has it's pretty good quality and this probably not. And that was my first assumption was we would lose a lot of forage quality. However, I was uh, wrong. You might hear that a lot throughout the presentation because I learned that uh, I'm wrong a lot. Uh, so if we look at the energy content, this is in vitro dry matter dry matter digestibility, but you can just think of it like TDN. So if you think about what the TDN of corn would be, we would put corn at about 83% in a forage-based diet. So if you look at oats in early uh, November here, uh-oh. Here locked up. So if you look at oats in early November, you can see that the yield or the quality here was quite high and that it doesn't uh, decrease tremendously over the winter going into early January. Uh, it doesn't decrease a whole lot. And let's see if I can get rid of this. And if you look at radish and turnip leaf, we see very similar things. Very high quality in October um, and early November, and that it maintains its quality fairly well into uh, the winter. And so, even though we do lose a little bit of TDN, I mean, we're still at 70% TDN on oats. We're still at 80 
on radish and turnip leaf. And so you can't really find a hay that's that good a quality. Uh, so it's okay that it turns brown, looks ugly. It's still very, very high energy. And uh, the next part of quality, right, would be crude protein. And you can see we also do not lose crude protein. Um, this was some stuff that was planted after corn silage, and it was a bit higher in crude protein because we did add uh, 40 pounds of nitrogen onto that field with a um, late August planting. And you can see the plants took up a lot of nitrogen, and they were fairly high crude protein, but still we were uh, in good state with these samples and uh, they didn't really decrease into the winter. So if we look at uh, gains of calves that were grazing on either oat brassica mixes, and when I talk about brassicas, I'm really talking about radishes and turnips, those type of things, um, or oats alone uh, across, we have eight different trials where we've done that over the past uh, three years. You can see they do vary. Um, these are 450 to uh, 600 pound calves, depending on the trial and the year. And uh, they usually graze for about 60 days. We uh, did not do any kind of rotation. We essentially set stock them. They start grazing and they graze until uh, we felt like forage was limiting, which is typically, you know, when it's about uh, two inches or so of growth and what I really wanted to show you here is I, I kind of broke down by the year so you can see there's something that really sticks out and that's 2015 it didn't matter um, the mix in three and four was almost exactly the same in terms of quality and proportions uh, the calves were actually the same genetics of calves um, this was actually calves out at uh, US Mark and Clay Center um, so these were weaned in mid-September. They were backgrounded a little bit, straightened out in a dry lot, and then turned out. So we started grazing uh, usually the 1st of November up to the 15th of November, depending on uh, when uh, we were able to turn out. But you can see this game was very, very different. And the same thing here, this five uh, and comparing it back to say something like seven, uh, the difference in games is really a weather dependent thing. This year we had a lot of precipitation. If I remember correctly, we had six different events during that 60 day grazing period where uh, those calves got wet hair coats. And so it really increased their energy requirements. It actually wasn't a particularly cold year but it was uh, wet. And uh, so that's one of the things that we've realized is that there's a lot of variability. On the mean is two pounds per day, which is pretty doggone good. Um, and we also see that heavier calves, so say 600 pound calves, it looks like they gain a little better than lighter calves, like 450. And I think the difference is protein requirement, specifically um, having enough uh, true protein getting uh, to those calves. So what we talk about bypass protein is probably why we don't get quite as good of gains on those calves. If we look at costs on all these different trials, we have some variability in seed costs depending on the seeding rates. Uh, this first trial we had actually very light seeding rates. We were only about 80% of probably what we should have been. Um, but the rest of them were uh, somewhere around 20 to $30, depending on the proportion of brassica to oats, because we typically do about 80 to 85 pounds of oats, and then if we add a brassica, we'll reduce uh, the amount of oats a bit. Uh, these were actually a little heavier. They were 86 pounds of oats with about a pound and a half of turnip and uh, two pounds of radish. Uh, somebody asked about the stocking rates for the calves, and we ranged anywhere from about one calf per acre to 1.7 calves per acre, depending on the amount of yield we got in that year. Uh, so if we look at 
uh, the cost here, you can see the, the bulk of the cost, right, is seed. And then if you look at three, four, five, six, those with little green bars on them, those are ones that were after corn silage and we put on uh, 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen. I'll tell you, I'm, I, I didn't put the nitrate levels on there, uh, but on those trials, nitrate levels were quite high, ranging anywhere from 2,000 parts per million nitrate nitrogen up to eight. And the message that came across to me is that the later we plant, the less likely that we're gonna be able to make use of that nitrogen. Uh, those plants took it up, but they didn't really grow with it. And so in my mind, uh, I probably would not have done that <laughs> uh, again. Uh, so there's another mistake I made. Uh, <laughs> I'm learning, uh, like everybody else, that that's, that's one of those things I think I, in, the, in the future we're not going to do. Again, with those high levels of nitrates, we didn't seem to have any problems. We had no calves uh, die. We had no issues with, uh, with where well, you can see what the gains were. They looked really good. So looking at cost of gain, if you take those costs that I just showed you, we add on 10 cents per head for yardage and a $5 per acre uh, for fencing. And so and that we usually look at our costs of gain com compared to the seeding costs, the seed, uh, fencing, and then of course uh, in those cases where we had nitrogen. So you can see uh, again, quite variable. If we had the fertilizer, those costs were much higher. And then you can see two of these that I starred for you here, uh, four and six. Those two trials were years we had to pull off before we really fully utilized the forage. And it was because we had uh, a couple icing events that happened uh, kind of back to back. And we got to the point where we decided rather than trying to continue to feed hay, we were just going to pull them. And so um, in both of those instances, we actually did come back in later with cows and graze it off, but I didn't count that into the value. So I'm probably charging a little bit too much for the cost of gain. But if you look at what our gain is, 54 cents on average is pretty competitive with other options for backgrounding calves. It's not a home run every year. You know, we don't have 36 cents or 26, 21 cents every year, but on average, we were looking pretty good. Now, the other thing I, I wanted to provide context to was, well, what if I used it, say, for fall calving cows? I, I showed you the quality is really high, high protein, high energy fall calving cows makes sense um, in my mind. Uh, we've also developed some heifers on it. but So I wanted to give you kind of on an AUM basis, if I said, well, how much grazing did we actually get out of it? So taking that stocking rate times the number of days times the weight of the calves. And you can see, again, quite variable, but ranging uh, anywhere from uh, 0.71, that's really due to forage production because we didn't seed enough um, up to this 1.9 this year we were able to graze actually 90 days because it was a nice open dry winter <laughs> that worked out really well but on average we're about 1.4 AUMs per acre uh, with the set stocking systems where we're essentially just grazing until they're done I will tell you uh, that we do appear to have a lot of loss because if I calculate based off of uh, how much forage was out there per acre um, and say how much disappeared per calf per day, it looked about to be about 40 pounds uh, per calf per day, which we know that's not what they're eating. So to me, that says we have some efficiency loss with the set stocking. And so I wanted to show you uh, this is some data from U.S. Mark where um, they actually grazed some fall cows on this same type of oat brassica mix, actually the same mix as some of what we've been doing with the calves. 
but they do a little different in their grazing uh, system. They, in this particular one, they either do like a seven day allocation uh, or they're doing three day allocations. And if you just look at the harvested AUMs per acre, you can see, um, you know, they're higher than what we were with set stocking. And um, they're really ranging somewhere around 2.6 AUMs per acre. And their grazing efficiency was on average about 50%, which is what we would expect. So uh, I would say there's probably some value into managing the grazing a bit more than what we did with the calf data. And indeed, uh, this is be the, the other system in my mind, this is the epitome of managing grazing, and that's uh, daily allocation using a pivot fence. And again, this was an oat turnip radish mix that they were doing dry cows. And so dry cows have a much lower energy requirement. So they could actually allocate, I think they had uh, here, you know, on average about 300 head, they added head as they went, but um, they were giving them like an eighth of an acre, which I calculated out to be about 15 pounds of dry matter per head per day. But given the quality, uh, I actually calculated that was about mm. right for what they needed to. And indeed, if uh, you looked at the condition on the cows over the winter, they actually gained weight in that system. So uh, that looks pretty doggone efficient. Um, this is a pivot fence, which essentially is a fence that they hook to the pivot and then uh, turn the pivot on to move the fence to give them uh, their day's feed. And those cows figure out really quickly that at the end of the pivot, it moves the farthest the quickest. And so they all go down there when you start to move the pivot. So if we want to go back to uh, the cost per grazed AUM with that 1.4 AUMs per acre, so that calf data, I wanted to put a cost on it to compare to uh, grazing cows in the set stocking system. And again, quite variable, but with those costs, we were looking anywhere from $16 an AUM up to 75 with an average of about 40. And a lot of you are probably going, well, what's my cost of AUMs? Um, some people don't think in AUMs, but I did want to show you in Nebraska, this is our pasture uh, rental rate survey. And this is the data from that. And you can see that what people are paying per AUM varies across the state. But on average, we're looking at somewhere around $45 an AUM for pasture. So I've already calculated in the cost of fencing and some extra labor costs. So that looks pretty, pretty competitive, especially for that off season when you're probably out of pasture already. Uh, but again, not always a home run. It depends on the year and whether you get lucky with weather. <laughs> uh, the last thing I really kind of wanted to talk about was uh, fall planting for spring growth. So as we talk about, say, corn silage ground, uh, for us, that would be a lot of the corn silage ground would fall beyond uh, the uh, time frame I gave you to say you can't get much fall forage. And so might be time to consider planting something for spring growth uh, and then our corn to soybean systems, corn for corn grain, that is um, also our kind of late. So I wanted to show you, we did have an on-farm study uh, this year where we grazed some rye with calves. And the rye was planted in two fields. One field was after soybeans, and the other field was actually after wheat that then had a sorghum sedan grass planted on it. And then after the sorghum sedan grass was harvested for hay, we planted rye. I'll tell you that with that system, uh, the rye was very slow to get established because soil moisture was a challenge in that field. And we should have watered it because we did have a pivot and we didn't. So um, in the spring, it was farther behind and it did uh, 
we ended up stocking it uh, at a half a calf an acre. Um, and then the other field we were able to stock at a much higher rate. And so on average, we ended up with two head per acre across the two fields. Uh, so the soybean field looked a lot better. But we planted uh, Elbon rye on November 1st. So uh, this is fairly late. Uh, and I would say we've done fairly well with establishing even that late. Uh, I've seen a lot of producers be able to make it work in corn and soybean systems with planting that late. Sometimes it doesn't even appear like it germinates, uh, but they get a nice stand in the spring. We were able to graze for 22 days in that trial. Uh, and I'll tell you, again, I made some mistakes, one of which was we were doing um, some supplementation research in that we had ionophore or no ionophore in a mineral, so I had a bunch of groups of calves out there, and so I did not rotationally graze. And that was a huge mistake in the spring. Uh, it ended up that we, we grazed off the forage quickly, as you can see. We had made a deal with them that we were going to actually go until uh, the first week of May. So I had two more weeks I could have grazed, but I ran out of forage. What's interesting is that we pulled them off, and six days later we had six to seven inches of forage again. We could have been back out there. So if I had rotationally grazed, uh, we could have done a little better job. But you can see, we gained 3.2 pound a day um, with those calves. Uh, these were calves that were backgrounded on stocks and were gaining uh, about a pound and a half a day. Uh, Jake asked what the ionophore study showed. I'll tell you, we didn't have... Uh, enough replication to pick up the effect of the onophore, in my opinion. Um, but I think, if I remember correctly, it was uh, about a tenth of a pound a day difference between the onophore and the no ionophore in the mineral, which is about what I would expect. You have some responders who eat the mineral and some that don't. And so, on average, if you look at the, the expected response for onophore, uh, that's probably what I would have expected. Bottom line, would I use an ionophore in my mineral when I'm grazing calves on cover crop? And the answer is yes, I would. Uh, because I think we get a little boost in, in gains. Um, we get a little bit of uh, risk management for bloat. And so if you look at the wheat grazing data, it's pretty clear to me that it's worth it. Hopefully in another year, will allow us to pick up that difference statistically. So uh, in terms of what species you might select if you're planting, uh, it was Remensen that we were using, not Bovatech. Uh, difference between the two is probably very small. Remensen seems to be a little bit stronger effect than Bovatech. So yield and quality of winter cereals. I wanted to show you this data that was taken from Fall City. and really just wanted to point out the difference uh, between species of what you might plant in the fall. And so one is that there's southern rye and then there's northern type rye. Southern rye come out of dormancy a little bit quicker than northern type rye, and most of our variety non-stated that we would get in Nebraska are the northern type rye. And so you can see if you look at the difference between yields that we have here in this little demo, um, the Elbon rye, which is a southern rye, uh, was able to yield a little bit better in the early spring, and it did come on a little bit sooner. And so we think we can graze about a week earlier with a southern rye compared to uh, a northern rye. You can see there's really no difference in quality, uh, TDN or crude protein. I also have on here barley and triticale because I wanted to show you the differences. Barley, in general, we see uh, barley is usually just behind in that it doesn't come on as quickly. I'll tell you that barley will maintain its quality a lot longer into uh, the spring. So if you're not using it in a cover crop system, there may be some advantages there 
in that it'll maintain its quality. It doesn't want to go to maturity as quickly. I think triticale might be the best of both worlds in that uh, certain varieties of triticale can look uh, very good in terms of yield. Uh, it's still a little bit slower than a southern rye to take off, but it maintains its quality longer. So I like a combination of the two, uh, either in the same field or uh, what I like to think about is, do I have some fields that I plant to elb on that I go and I get on early and then I can get cattle off of those fields and move to triticale fields and those might be the fields that I uh, graze uh, later into the spring uh, before planting. So I think there's some nice options there. Triticale sometimes it's more expensive. Uh, recent years prices have come down a bit but that's one of the challenges sometimes with triticale. Uh, this is a picture of the Elbon rye versus the variety on stated that were planted on the same day uh, side by side and you can see there would be a big yield difference there's also a big maturity difference and so that's something to consider uh, the challenge with southern rye is that they take off and they're going to want to go mature so grazing management is extremely important you got to have enough animals on there early enough uh, so you get enough pressure so that you can maintain quality. I also wanted to just talk a second about fitting grazing into a corn soybean system because it can be a challenge if you're not willing to back off on uh, your planting date. And so if you think about corn uh, being planted for us, the usual dates are May 3rd to May 19th, the most active dates. Um, we have some challenges because not only do we have this earlier date, but we also have this fact that uh, it's suggested you terminate at least a week prior to planting to avoid some of the lilyopathic effects or negative effects that might happen with having a small cereal uh, before your corn, which is probably driven a lot by nitrogen. Um, but there's some other things going on there as well, which makes it hard if you're thinking you're probably going to start grazing April 1st. So then if I, I'm only going to plant May 3rd, then I can only graze for two weeks. Soybeans, on the other hand, later planting date, and there's no lilyopathic effect with them. So there's a much more open window. You can graze right up to the day you plant and you can pull off. So um, the challenge, right, is, well, I have the residue and I want to use the residue for grazing. That doesn't really make sense. But this picture is uh, a picture of a producer and he plants all of his acres. But what he does is this is a conventional cornfield that he essentially went in and after, right after he harvested, he put the cows in to graze the residue and he brought the drill in and started planting when the cows are in there. And then uh, about 10 days to two weeks later, he was done with the residue because he essentially moved all of his cows into that field, he went to another field and that's the stand he got. It's a pretty nice stand. So I think that's something that's uh, got some potential. Paul just asked about grass tetany being a concern with these cool season uh, small cereal grains in the spring with lactating cows. It definitely is a concern. Um, on the calves, I did have a, a little bit higher mag mineral, by no means a high mag mineral. I think on my math, I think it was 5% magnesium. If I was grazing a lactating cow, I'd probably look for something that was a 10%. Uh, magnesium mineral, but it can definitely be avoided with having uh, a palatable uh, higher mag mineral out there. Uh, so it is a risk, but a uh, avoidable uh, risk. So uh, just to summarize what we've seen, uh, they can be cover crops in the fall can be used. <clears throat> Uh, to background calves, and I think that's a great use for it given uh, the high quality of those uh, forages. And 
Um, we can gain about 1.3 to 3 pound a day without any kind of supplementation. The big things that we have in terms of risk is weather uh, from both sides of the equation from forage growth like this year where if it's dry land and we had no rain, uh, we have some risk. And then from calf performance, uh, if you get precipitation when you don't want it, which is when the calves are out there grazing, uh, we can get some uh, reduced performance that way. And then grazing management in the spring, I think, is much, much bigger. I thought we could get away with set stocking in the fall because um, we're actually setting out calves after all the growth has happened. And so I didn't think there was a huge advantage, and I take that back now. <laughs> But uh, it's definitely extremely important and way more important in the spring when it's actively growing to maintain quality as well as uh, to allow it to recover and get extra growth so you can get more grazing out of the deal. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Lane and uh, he'll talk a little bit about what his observations and his funds been and then we'll take any other questions. Well, thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks for having me, Steve. This has been a an educational learning curve from the start, and uh, probably each year we probably didn't try hard enough if we didn't fail on on one farm or part of a farm or a certain situation. So, and really and truly, if it rains, you don't have any problems whatsoever. Um, the spring was real wet. I guess our biggest problem was deciding when to go plant, uh, when to kill it, and how to go about uh, getting it killed and planted. Um, and we did, we did plant, we plant a lot into green cover crops. We really don't kill much prior to planting. Um, sometimes the cows are out there when when we run the drill across the bean field and that tends to be some of our best yields if we can get them in early um, a lot of our all of our standing corn gets cover crops flown onto it uh, normally turnips radishes and elbon rye we, we use 100 percent elbon rye in uh, relation to iowa we are, I'm going to say, 25 miles south of the Iowa border. or straight west of Rockport, Missouri, 25 minutes. And so uh, we're, we're 25 miles south of the southern, the southern border of Iowa. And so we try to fly on, uh, try to keep it at $30 an acre or, or a little under on our standing corn with turnips, radishes, and rye. Is that seed cost or is that seed plus? That's, that's seed with application. And with that, we don't run any background, we don't background any cattle on cover crops. So it's all, all fall pears or dry cows. And so our nutrient requirements for these cattle that we're running on it is plenty good. And so they're loose, they're kicking a lot out the back, they're healthy, uh, normally in very good condition. Um, when they're on cover crops, like with uh, on corn stalks with cereal rye, elbon rye, turnips and radishes, they will not eat mineral until it's gone, until the cover crops are gone. They will eat salt, but they very rarely touch the mineral. And so we know, and the mineral we feed, if they need the nutrients, they'll eat the mineral. If they don't, they won't touch it. And we do not feed much mineral on cover crops in the fall or the spring. Um, so on our, on our bean ground, our bean stubble, this year, uh, Dad put some winter triticale on some of his ground, and we actually went back in and drilled 
some Elbon rye as well on on all the acres. So either triticale or rye is on our soybean acres. What's your seeding rate? Uh, seeding rate uh, anywhere from anywhere from 50 pounds up to 90 pounds on rye, which kind of a wide variety it kind of depends on the farm and what we plan to do with it some of these acres we probably won't get over in the springtime and some of these acres may be maybe a little wetter and so those we try to back off to maybe 40 to 50 pounds to where in the springtime the rye actually is using up some of the moisture and yet the sun can get down to the soil and kind of help dry out some areas so um, so all, all of our acres are covered, uh, we graze, uh, we don't, we don't move fence, <clears throat> we don't move fence, it's all set stocking. Um, How many cows do you put per acre? Uh, we try, financially, we look at it like, on average, good years, bad years, a dollar per acre or dollar per day for 30 days per cow so when we figure we spend thirty dollars an acre that'll last one cow for a month and so a dollar for a dollar a day we can't find we can't buy hay find hay feed hay start a tractor for a dollar per cow per day and Last year we had pretty good rains. It was probably cheaper than that. <laughs> this year we had some issues. Um, on one of the farm, actually the farm that we planted green into green, uh, planted corn into, I think we had so much uh, cover on the ground this fall from that rye that laid on top of the ground. I'm not so sure we didn't have very good seed to soil contact and then on top of it we had very little rain to get the uh, from it was seeded the end of August what, what day dad September end of August to September 2nd early September into August is when we try to get it done and that's a drilling that's aerial that's, that's aerial. with the airplane and what was your seeding rate and on that, we would have put 40, 50 pounds. 40, 40 of rye, two of two. Yeah, 40 of rye, two of turnips, and two of radish. And, and, one, of rape and, and one pound of rapeseed. This is the first year we've used rapeseed. And some farms took better than others, but uh, it was pretty, we didn't get rain for a month till October. And then since that rain spell, we've only had a quarter inch since then. Um, not it. Any questions? Seeding rates of turnips and radishes into corn? Yeah. Pretty much two, tur two of turnips and two of radishes. You, but do you plant turnips and radishes alone or you usually intercede No, we, we always intercede something with them. Uh, we've never planted them as a monocrop. Uh, that diversity is big for us. Uh, not that more is better, but I, I think it is in this situation. Um, them cattle, they know what they like, and they will literally make a circle on your farm. And on a half section, we had uh, corn stalks. We had basically a hundred, let's say, 105 acres of corn stalks. We had uh, 120 acres of rye and 60 acres of bean stubble and then some pasture and a creek running through it. And those cattle would literally make a circle every day and that's what we were calving on. And so it's kind of neat to see that they, they balance their own ration really. What other questions do you guys have? This picture here, where this cow stands, we didn't graze that very much. Um, in the background, there was 12 acres there, 
and uh, that field actually dad went and we got a John Deere 750 no-till drill and he drilled it shortly after we took the cows off and there was hoof print there was hoof tracks out there a couple inches deep and we had a wet spring he went out there and drilled it and uh, a lot of people I think laughed at us and the beans came up and looked phenomenal and uh, it was a one pass chemical a, a lot of a lot of what we do anymore is pretty much one pass get the rye killed with drilled beans and that's pretty much it and so we're saving on chemical costs we're saving on winter feed and spring feed we have really excellent feed that way um, our soil health is really getting good and there's there's so many more benefits just than just in cow feed that your soil will change very quickly and for the better the erosion I mean, a lot less erosion than we've ever had um, we took some some uh, microbial biomass samples from some of your fields and you could really see the difference between your fields and the neighbors fields and the amount of microbial biomass you had extremely high levels and some high organic matters actually our organic matters are definitely increasing um, when we plant corn, now let me go back and uh, answer some of these questions. What kind and size of drill do you use? We've got a John Deere 750, it's a 15 foot, and we also just got a 20 foot John Deere 750. Are you no tilling your cash crop? Yes, I haven't, we haven't pulled a disc across the farm in years. Um, so we no-till everything uh, the pros the pros are we don't have to uh, I don't have to disc ahead of it uh, we got plenty other stuff to do and uh, the cons are I don't I don't know I like it may it hurts my gut to pull a disc it uh, it's almost like going to war. I feel like it's I'm going to war on my soil if I would do that. And when I can in the springtime, my wife and I were out riding through the cows last spring, and I hopped off the horse and just grabbed a random corn stalk, pulled it up, and there was five earthworms under that one corn stalk. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, one of our experiences, we had some fields that were side by side, one that was dissed uh, because we actually incorporate some liquid manure from a feedlot, but uh, the difference in the amount of grazing we actually got off of the cover crop was huge between our no-till field and our dissed field because they ended up trampling a lot in. We had a lot of pugging because they have no soil structure, and so it's not able to hold them up as much. So that's one benefit, I think, of the no-till from that standpoint. And the other one is everybody's concerned about compaction, but we just, mm -hmm. our measurements of the impacts of the cattle on the soil is, is essentially nominal. What we do see is some surface uh, compaction if you measure it from penetration resistance in the early spring if you're grazing like in February, March. But then by June, you can't measure it anymore because it's so shallow that the freeze, or not freeze thaw, but um, the uh, wetting and drying cycles the, and the earthworm, the microbial activity, it ameliorates it or gets rid of it for you. So we don't see it build up over time. So I don't think it's as big of an issue as everybody thinks it is. You see that penetration resistance in your planter because you got to put a little more down pressure on there and you think it's a huge deal but it's really not show them that picture planting corn in that tall um when uh 
Okay, Tom asked, uh, how much does your organic matter increase per year on average where you use cover crops and livestock? Uh, Gary Leswing, the extension agent, he come out. We had a field day. 2016. Couple, two years ago. Or two. two or three years ago. Two years ago. And he did soil tests. Um, and in five years, we increased organic matter by 1% on this this farm that had cover crops on it continually and you know a soil sample is just a snapshot of of your soil at that given point in time and so you know it's hard to say per year what it's going to increase but uh oh gary you said it was 2015 so two and a half years ago and but in the organic matter, it's going to increase. It's going to increase. And when Gary did that, he took or he took samples where we fed cows prior to oh, where we fed quite a few cows, and the organic matter was was real high. <laughs> I mean, it was four and five, maybe close to six percent, five something, and so. When you incorporate our poorest farm, we have a, an 80 that uh, doesn't have any water on it, and we've never run cows on it. That farm, it's it's not getting uh, it's not improving as quickly as the farms that we run cows on the hardest. And so, cover crops with no till and cover crops and livestock. We're seeing huge, huge uh, advantages of using them. Now, I would say, uh, like the different types of soil, anything I can say, take with a grain of salt from where you live, because your soils might compact more or less. I mean, our our soils compact uh, pretty quickly if we get the we don't get much spring rains and we're when we're running cows out there or if it rains and we run cows out there and then it shuts off raining that's when we get in trouble we get surface crusting we get surface crust and the ground gets pretty hard our we got some clay loam soils and they get pretty tight and we got high magnesium and uh it can it can be an educational event but uh i like to have some growth above ground to where it keeps that soil shaded and and keeps the ground from completely drying out because if we get if we get the corn planted which i was going to talk about on my corn planter um i've got fertilizer coulters that are set off the row four inches four to five inches and we run starter, uh, food grade starter in furrow, and we're running liquid nitrogen off the side. And so when we planted last spring, it was May 8th or 9th. That was the first corn that we planted. We sat and waited and waited and didn't know if we should start or not. And it was cool and cold and wet. And so finally we went out and I planted into this field that's pictured here. I mean, it was four foot tall, and it was it turned out very good. But we do put uh, we put a hundred pounds of liquid beside the row, and then we came back and and put on uh, dry urea with the airplane later in the season. So. Infiltration, yeah, Gary put on some stuff. Uh, infiltration rates were four and a half to five inches per hour with manure and grazing cover crops. And that was on Dad's farm, the home quarter. Um, so Bruce asked about the cash value of adding livestock, I, I assume compared to not having 
uh, livestock and the soil health benefits, as Lane kind of mentioned. The only data that I have at the moment, although we currently have some experiments where we're comparing cover crops with grazing and without to, to a control, is some data from residue, corn residue grazing. And in fact, uh, we do see some increases in soil microbial biomass when we incorporate the grazing on the stalks compared to uh, not having those cattle grazing stalks. The value, the question on the value is a good one. I don't know how to put a value to it other than we actually see some improvements in subsequent crop yields, two to three bushels on soybeans in a corn and soybean rotation. Uh, and so that it's the only value that I know how to put economics on because I'm A, not a soil specialist, but B, I'm also not an economist. <laughs> so I think there is some value to having the livestock. Hopefully we'll have a better answer uh, in a few years on the incorporating livestock and cover crops compared to just cover crops. Bruce, I'd, I'd say to that, um, the money that you put towards this, if you get it established, it's worth it. You know, there, there is more to, there is more to raising more bushels as far as the bottom line, the profitability. Um, you know, you can, you can say you raised all the bushels in the world, but if it still wasn't profitable, it don't matter. And there's soil health, the erosion, I mean, we're losing very, very little topsoil. Our topsoil is actually building, I'd say not declining. Um, what, what's that worth as far as uh, micronutrients that you're losing off your fields? Um, yeah, that's a good there's, point. There's, you know, as far as putting a dollar value on it, I don't think I could ever do it, but I'm saying, from what I, from what we've seen, there is no way that I want to go away from it. It's money well spent. Yeah, and higher, Tom, uh, the higher organic matter. I mean, there's there's nitrogen value there. Water holding there's capacity. water holding capacity. Oh, and tonight, uh, Steve, do you have? Do you have some of those pictures that I emailed you tonight? Lane, I never got that email. I was okay. I was oh, just right. checked it again now to see if I had got anything in my inbox, but I never saw anything. Okay, maybe I sent too many at once. <laughs> I will uh let me look here. But I took some pictures tonight. It it looks real similar to uh to that field that we're looking at. But I took and dug up, oh, probably top three inches, I suppose, and there was moisture all the way in that field. Wow. And we have not, we've had a quarter inch of rain. It is dry as a bone. It's dry here. And that, that soil, there is, there is very little soil it shows. And, uh. And so when we can shade the soil, I was saying I was going to say this earlier too. If we can if we can plant corn and we can get that corn to sprout and come through and get a good stand, there's a lot less worry for drought after that if we can get our soil profile full in the springtime. Because we the soil temperature stays so much cooler when it's covered as to out there on a hundred degree day, the sun just baking on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw some temperatures of some of the soil when they didn't have any cover, and I've been amazed at how high it can get. I mean, you know, 110 on that soil surface. Can you measure those cows that don't like to get eaten? <laughs> I'm going to uh, see if I can send you. Carl, I agree. It is an armor. I'm talking about erosion, talking about temperature control, moisture, savings. I will tell you, when you get into 
not going towards Iowa, but as we go further west, there is some challenges with moisture use in cover crops. Um, you know, when we get into that 20 inch range and we do see some subsequent yield decreases in that situation. But in my mind, for eastern Nebraska and going east, there's uh, no issues with that. In fact, I think sometimes we can get into the field sooner. Um, it can hold us up. I'll tell you that field where we did the grazing of the rye, uh, if you remember this spring, it was uh, fairly wet. And where we had rye and we didn't graze and where we grazed rye, we could get into the field and plant sooner than the field where the part of the field where we had nothing. And in fact, we had to delay because we were waiting on that part of the field uh, for the trial because we didn't want to have different planting dates. Uh, so I think there's some other tangible benefits that we don't always talk about. Uh, Margaret, uh, we're corn, soybean, and some small grain. Uh, yeah, we take, yeah, that's what we do. Corn, soybeans, and triticale or rye, we take to, some of that we take to harvest, some of it we uh, plant corn and soybeans back into. I'm going to try to send you a picture, Steve. Sounds good. I'll pull it up when I see it. And it's still trying to send. Maybe I should have sent a smaller picture. <laughs> but tonight, I, when I went out there, so on July 25th, or let me back up. So we harvested the uh, Elbon rye July 7th, 6th? Here. July 6th. We come back and we put uh, about 50 pounds of oats, 10 pounds of grazing corn. We threw any leftover soybeans we had in. We put uh, turnips, a two pound of turnips, two pounds of radishes, and a pound of sunflowers. So it was a six way. It was a six way mix. And uh, went in there and drilled it July 25th. And so, and we're and we've yet to graze this. So Lane Tom was asking about how many cattle you have. On your farm and uh, your overall stocking rate per acre. Not enough when the prices. Dad always says not enough when the uh, prices are good and too many on here <laughs> when prices are bad. <laughs> <laughs> but my banker only knows. We don't run any yearlings um, on cover crops. Everything, all of our wing, all of our yearlings are. In a feedlot, and then uh, Dad takes retains ownership on all all the fat cattle, so we sell very little through the sale barn. How many fields do you have that you end up planting and grazing? Um, as far as grazing, ninety percent. Pretty much of of the eight farms we we graze seven of the eight. The only farm we don't graze is that eighty acres that uh, doesn't have fence or water around it. Otherwise, we put in a lot of in every one of these farms. It's electric fence that we put around, just one wire electric fence, and then pull it up in the springtime again. Hey Carl, to your to your comment about the arid region uh, cover crops, I will tell you we've been doing some things, uh, looking at grazing and the use of maybe uh, grazing to offset the yield losses in terms of if I can pay for it off the backs of the cattle. And this year it looked really good. We had maybe a six or seven bushel decrease with using 
these type of cover crops, oats, turnips, radishes after wheat, and typically in that system, they put wheat in to build up soil moisture for the corn. And indeed, we did still got uh, a seven bushel decrease in uh, corn yield, but the cattle were more than able to pay for it uh, uh, in that situation in terms of compared to like hay feeding or something. It was, it was a no brainer. Uh, of course, this year we had a lot more rain in the spring, which helped us out. So this picture that's up on the screen, it's turned uh, sideways. Yeah, sorry about that. I couldn't figure that out. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. But uh, I took that tonight about 5 o'clock, and that's the field where I dug up the soil, and there's still moisture in it. I mean, there there is literally 98% of that soil is covered, and the what's not covered, a deer probably stuck his nose down there but oh it uh it's pretty neat stuff and i guess you could probably call it a seven way mix because on the back of our combine we got a spreader that i don't no matter how well you get your combine set you're still going to knock out probably a bushel and shatter um head shatter and out the back of the combine and so you really reseed a rye crop too so it uh down in the bottom I'm trying to send Steve a video about a 50 second video if it'll send I think it might have sent Jake uh, Jake asked you if you harvest any of your forages store them. we do you hay anything we have uh, we have not done that yet I shouldn't say that we tried on one farm early on we put some up for hay but uh, I don't know. We like grazing. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely some advantages and disadvantages in my mind. And one of the challenges is that we're usually working in spring and late fall. And uh, in the spring, having a window to actually get it dry is a challenge. In the fall, uh, it's usually by the time we get enough yield, uh, we can't get it dry. And so, um, it's really something where if you're doing an annual forage system, you can work it in, but it's a little harder for a pure cover crop where you're working on the edges of your cash cropping season. Tom, uh, these six-way mixes, we haven't put cows in yet. Um, if it, it, as long as we don't get, uh, we can get snow and be fine, but if we get freezing rain, that's where we're in, we're in trouble. I mean, nothing's going to paw through frozen ice. Mm -hmm. But as far as a foot of snow, um, these cows, it's kind of, it's pretty cool when you can go to the field and they got snow up to the eyeballs and they don't even care that you're there. They're happy, they're, they're full, and uh, they're healthy. Down this 30 bushel oats back a layer. Yeah, there's probably, I mean, this, this oats, it's, uh, it went to seed. There's probably 30 bushels of oats out there. Yeah. We had some challenges with oats this year. We planted some too, and they went to seed on us. We didn't mean to. Jake asked how close are we to grazing year round? Um, there's the cows that we worked yesterday. I was thinking about this. There's still, we still got some out on grass. But they're going to go to corn stalks here this next week, probably. But other than a few minor bales of hay here and there, I don't think they've, like our recip cows from a year ago, they went from grass to corn stalks to cover crops in the springtime, calved on cover crops to pasture. They're still on pasture, and they're going to go to corn stalks and then to cover crops. They may not see more than a couple of days of, of hay to them in a couple of years. And so, and that's the cool part about this. If you can get your number of cows matched to your resources as far as acres that you can find to put cover crops on or your own acres to put cover crops on, it is not unrealistic 
to not have to feed much hay. Margaret, back to your question about uh, the yield losses on corn following grazed cover crops. That's actually grazed or not grazed, and that's in limited precipitation areas, 20, you know, a 20 inch kind of system or less. And it's, it really is water. If you look at what we've seen, it's looking at the soil moisture in the spring prior to planting. Uh, we do have a deficit, even with something that winter kills. So it's not something that you're going to see elsewhere, I don't think. And again, um, we don't have a lot of data looking at grazing cover crop versus not grazing the cover crop, but so far, it, there's really no difference in terms of the impacts that we've seen. And in that system, there was no difference either. Uh, where do you get the hay that you do feed? We put up some hay um, on our pastures that we have that we don't rent. We rent some grass and then the pastures that we own. Um, we do move cows to where well, this year, our broom got ahead of us. We had a lot of spring rains. And instead of it getting too mature, we hate it. And and then we regrazed it in the fall. And so we do we do put up some of our grass hay ourselves. Otherwise, uh, we buy hay wherever. My in-laws got some good hay. <laughs> it depends on come next spring, too. We have to find more hay. We don't know when the cover crops will last. Yeah, it, it all depends on how much moisture we get. Lane, I uh, I got that video you sent, but for some reason, Adobe's not reading the the file when I'm trying to upload it here. So I don't know if I can get it up. Okay. If you if you can get it to work, basically what I did, I I just pointed my camera to the ground and I took about three steps and stopped and walked about three more steps and stopped and and uh, Tom, I'll, I'll send you another picture directly down in the Tom to your question about a wet fall uh, or winter greatly reduce the energy value of the cover crop that's a good question um, that data I showed you was uh, two years and one of those two years was the 2015 data where I told you we had those six precipitation events. If you compared the two years, we really didn't see a huge amount of difference between them. So I think um, because it's typically cold enough to where we don't get a lot of microbial activity, uh, the only difference we might have is a little bit of leaching. Um, of some of the self solubles, but quite frankly, we lose most of that anyways after the first couple free free stalls. Um, so I don't think so, but I can't specifically answer it. I haven't done anything where I have enough years to to actually get replicates of of year with different conditions. But I think based off of looking at those two very different years, I think we're going to see the same trends. Uh, Carl talked about the buffalo roam in the plains. That's basically what we're trying to do is mimic mother nature with these cover crops. And that's where the diverse mix we feel is better instead of any monoculture. Because we're planting monoculture with our corn and soybeans. And uh, so the more diversity we can put into the soil, the more biology, the more... I mean that there is literally more living organisms that we're feeding in the soil than any pounds of beef we're feeding above ground. It uh, we've got a lot of livestock in the soil that we got to feed, and so they like uh, ice cream and steak and green beans, green beans and potatoes, and just like we do. So. Have you have you had any bloat issues? Jake asks if uh, you have any bloat issues. Um, we, Jake, we have literally had zero issues with any of the cover crops as far as health. We have had no grass tetany issues, no bloat issues, but we are we are dealing with uh, dry cows and like fall pears. Yeah. You know, as far as any calves. 
are concerned. But our calves grazing over the last three years, we've not had any bloat issues either. So um, I, if I was going to expect anything, it'd be really early in the spring, definitely not the fall grazing stuff, but I have just not seen it. So I don't typically worry about bloat all that much. And again, uh, I will tell you that for the fall grazing, most of the time we do have an on a four with the calves and the mineral because we want the extra game, which would help with bloat some. We haven't with heifers, and we've done three years of heifers, and we haven't seen anything. Uh, one, one thing I want to make, make sure that... Uh, if, if you've never planted cover crops before, uh, the herbicides that you use is number one. Don't expect to uh, go go put cover crops on your neighbor's ground that he doesn't want one weed growing on because more than likely the herbicide that he's using isn't going to let your cover crops grow either. And so... That uh, you've got you've got to be ahead of the ball game as far as what herbicides you're going to use, and I am not the one to talk to about that. Um, talk to your your local agronomist, your your chemical who's spraying your crops or your chemical rep, and they'll work with you as far as what to use because there are some um, there are some issues as far as herbicides to where you can throw a lot of money out there and have zero results. And and if you have any questions about the soil, you can always take you know dig a couple inches down and put it in a put it in a pot and put it in your house and by the window and put your seed that you're going to plant into it and water it and if it grows and then dies, it, it normally it'll grow, but then if it dies, don't put it out there. <laughs> If it grows and then uh, keeps growing for a couple weeks and the roots go down four inches or so, then you should be, you, you got a better chance of uh, having, having it survive. So Ron running me to, uh, to tell you that, uh, you know, if you, definitely if you haven't done cover crops before, but uh, being able to take advantage of uh, some of the NRCS, uh, cost shares that they have to get your feet under you is always uh, something's worthwhile. Uh, so looking at equip and those type of things are really useful to figure out uh, how to make the system work for you and kind of offset some of that risk uh, with getting started. Uh, so it's a it's a really a good way to to get your your feet wet, get your uh, get the ground underneath you and figure out how to make the system work for you. So this uh, this picture that's up on the screen now, that's just a straight shot down of what I, that's our six way, I should say seven way mix because the, the real green stuff looks like grass is Elbon rye that came out the back of the combine or that would had head shatter. Um, so and which is what's nice about that rye is next spring those roots are going to keep growing and it's going to loosen the soil up in the springtime yeah that's pretty cool i actually i'd heard all about this root growth and thought yeah okay whatever but we took some three inch rye in march and it had roots down uh 36 inches uh so three feet um and three three inch tall i mean it was planted after soybeans and so it had just come up so i started thinking oh maybe there's more to it than uh, uh than what i gave it credit for to begin with uh gary just mentioned there's a there's actually a lot of publications um on cover crop resources at the midwest uh cover crop and indeed, uh, the herbicide issues, for instance, uh, we have a publication uh, that talks about some of the residuals and which ones might work best. 
uh, on our cropwatch.unl.edu. I know Iowa has one too out of the Iowa Extension. I've seen it. Um, so there's a lot of places to find the information. And uh, as Lane mentioned, I would call your local Extension office. Most of those guys can find the information you need to help you out. I always just call. Uh, I have Extension educators that I call for specific things. So I call one who uh, knows the weed guide pretty doggone well and can find what I need to know for uh, helping producers out. So you just got to find your guys. There are so many people out there that are a wealth of knowledge that have done this for years and years and actually have done studies on it and have hard data. And I don't know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and I said, I'd never get on Twitter. <laughs> well, I got on Twitter and now Basically, everybody I follow is a cover crop guy, and Me too. you can learn so much by by reading reading articles and YouTube videos. Oh, I don't know how many hours of YouTube videos I've watched, and and uh, we actually, you know, a cousin of mine and my best man in my wedding, we get together every once in a while and we we YouTube videos in our basement. And, you know, just kind of throw ideas around and it's been really good because if you can, if you can get a group of people together of the, get a group of people together of the same mindset that it's not going to tell you, oh, look at you, you know, you're a cover crop guy mm -hmm. or this or that. And, you know, you don't want somebody that's going to bring you down because this stuff's real and you can be in a real mess too with it, but there's a, there's real benefits. And so get, get with a group of people that enjoy it and want to learn. And, uh, it's real enjoyable because you talk about it all the time. And there's so many people around the world that are doing this and it's just, I don't know. I've really enjoyed it. It's it's a passion and it's something you don't you just want to keep learning about. Do you use any atrazine? Like, no, mostly Roundup, a little. A little bit of a little bit of atrazine, um, but Roundup. Oh, uh, we used I think it was Dual Magnum on that on that uh, standing rye that we that we drilled or planted corn into last spring. So Jake, he asked a question about concerns for the cattle in terms of herbicides. And uh, there are some challenges. And, and one of those is if you're using a cover crop purely as a cover crop, uh, you can do exactly what Lane just said, which is you can test and see if, if the plant will grow and it lives, just do it. Um, when you have cattle, uh, you actually are required by federal law to follow the label, which means for grazing uh, that any of the plant back restrictions have to be followed. Uh, not necessarily because they've tested that there's residuals and that it's a problem. A lot of times it's because they haven't tested and so they use the longest possible residual in the worst case scenario. Um, and so it becomes a challenge because uh, a lot of people uh, are doing things and they make it work. Uh, as an extension professional, I have to advise you to follow the label. And a lot of times that means it really limits what herbicides you can use. What we use for research uh, is very limited on our herbicide rotation. So one of the things we do is rotate fields so that we can have different herbicides uh, in the rotation that allows us to still have good control of weeds and those type of things. Um, we've had been bit a couple times where I realized after I'd already planted that I can't use that field uh, because they're university cattle <laughs> and I can't graze something that's off label. So that's it's, it's definitely a challenge. Def definitely follow the labels. It's, it's tough, but atrazine, I mean, that's definitely not labeled for grazing. 
Mm-mm. It's got an I think an eighteen month for brassicas. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, do your best and it, herbicide. It's a tough situation, and like I said earlier, we're we're literally trying to get away from herbicide use, mm-hmm. and we're all of our farm ground is is uh, terraced, so we have very few acres that are level. <laughs> And if I was on level ground, I would honestly, I would try uh, rolling these cover crops and rolling and crimping to get it killed because there it literally leaves, if you got four foot of residue on top, standing on top of the ground and you lay that flat, you will not have a weed come through the rest of the summer where that's thick and i i got a lot of pictures on my phone i should have done a better job of getting them to you steve and and uh kind of showing some more of this stuff but uh it it's pretty amazing so everybody's situation is going to be different we have no way to roll these crops and get a you know a, we probably couldn't get 80 percent of it killed that way to where we'd still have to use chemicals, but I would love to get away from them. Well, Steve says they that uh, you guys have a farbinar on rolling and crimping cover crops if somebody's interested. Yeah, it because I really think it's if you could get away with it and make it work, you could do. Oh, it would just it'd be awesome, and your soil health would improve that much quicker by not using herbicides. As Roundup is. I don't know. It's a bad thing. Yep, we've been uh, trying to find people who are doing roller crimping cover crops and to get them to share their experiences because it's a learning curve just like everything else. But, man, when you get that down, it's it could do great things for your soil health and, you know, decreasing inputs and all that. If you, have, if you ever uh, go see or hear Ray Archuleta speak, he had a slide one day. He took his daughter's car. I can't remember if it was a Jetta or something. It was a small car, low to the ground. And he pr- he went out there and used it as his roller. He took that car and rolled over some tall standing rye. <laughs> he says, no matter how you can get it to, to the ground, that's all that matters. But you got to get it broke, and you got to get it killed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was uh, it made everybody laugh. That's for that's sure. That's good. But uh, yes, that. If you can make it, whatever you can make work with these cover crops, make it work because somebody, your neighbor is going to tell you it's not going to work. So try it. Yep. What's the cows going to say now when they go in the field? They're going to eat the oats? Yeah, so this uh, this picture that's up there, Dad was saying, well, what, what are the cows going to, when we turn them out there, what are they going to eat first? And normally the radishes are left last they're normally they'll eat the tops but the radish you'll think there'll be some sticking out of the ground and Mm -hmm. you'll think oh that was was a waste but they'll eat them i tell you we graze some cows on only oats and the oats look like these where they got all the heads on them and they just went through and stripped off the the heads they figured it out after they ate all the volunteer wheat so my guess is they'll eat all the volunteer rye and then they'll strip heads and there's no way in this situation to where the cow's muzzle can go down there and only get rye she's going to get dry matter quite a bit of dry matter along with this and so that's a pretty well balanced diet right there but they still will be loose well Mary and Lane, it looks like we've reached about the end of our time here. Um, and you guys did. It. I want to. I want to keep talking all night. <laughs> yeah. More questions. No. <laughs> I love that. And Lane, I like how you said how you know you talk about getting together with your cousin and with like-minded people and learning together and learning from each other and and that's what Practical Farmers tries to do with these farminars and everything we do. So it's um, you know we say uh, 
you know, always working together and always learning is what Practical Farmers does. So th thanks a lot to both of you for sharing. Mary, thanks for sharing your research, and Lane and, and uh, Ron as well. Thanks, you guys, for sharing your experience on your farm. You guys are doing really great stuff, and we're glad to hear about it. So um, thanks. Well, we thank you for what you're doing, Steve, and that's, uh, that's a great thing you got going. Yep. If anybody wants to stop at Casey's and bring some apple crisp donuts some morning and stop in at the place, I'll show them the <laughs> there you go. Yeah, anybody's welcome. Anybody's welcome anytime. Bring apple it, crisp uh, from Casey's. <laughs> we, love, we, love, we, love, we love to have people stop by. You're, out of, you're welcome out of the Johnson Cattle Company, but bring those Casey's donuts. <laughs> no. Apple crisp donuts. Get it oh, the apple crisp. crisp. Yep, all right. Well, yeah, thanks again for sharing everything tonight, guys, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to take a week off next week, but we'll be back in January, and we'll have some more cover crop topics and grazing topics, so stay tuned to PFI for those announcements coming soon. But great presentation, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs>